sophistication of Destiny Call and Gems are celebrating 17 years in the business with a best of album which resolutely refuses to leave the top 10. From a remarkable band with more hits than you might think comes the number one album, The Best of James. We've got the best of album out at the minute. 15 hits together on one collection for the first time. And a lot of times when a best out album comes out, it's, uh, it's often <clears throat> when bands are just about to split up. The Best of James. It's out now. And you want us to split up, do you? Uh, of course not. Uh, um, no, I mean, this came about almost by chance. It was someone in the record company pointed out to us that we'd had something like 15 top 30 hits and we'd be like to put them on the record. And we said, yeah, great, it's fine, do it. Come home, come home, come home. It's obviously done very well. We didn't expect it to go to number one. That was a great thrill. Um, but the other thing was that it, it allowed us to take stock of our whole kind of career. I think we've been taken for granted in this country for about four years, and it suddenly made people go, wow, God, yeah, they've had a lot of records, haven't they? A lot of good records. So we may be gorgeous, so we may be famous, come back when we're getting old. Your last single, Destiny Calling, seemed to take a critical look at the way the music industry treats artists. Was this a personal thing that you lot have experienced? Yeah. Destiny Calling was um, playfully critical. Um, it was also acknowledging that we're part of it. Yes, that's the price of fame. You become a product to a certain group of people who are making money out of you. And you have to accept that. I mean, that used to be terrifying to me. And the fear of success kind of, you know, landing you out as, a, as an artist or musician was always a, a great fear of mine. When we first did sit down, I was quite freaked out by it. And we were getting amazing letters from people, people playing at funerals and weddings and all kinds of things. We were asked to play in hospitals to children on life support machines and in comas and things like that. It had a very strong impact. And at one point, we tried stopping playing it. And I, I wanted to keep, like if I played it, I wanted it to be acoustic one week and heavy metal the next and change it. I've come much more to terms with it in the last few years that it's its own thing and it's not really much to do with me anymore. It's a gift, you know. It's like something you have to let go of. Caught your hand inside the till, slammed your fingers in the drawer, fought with kitchen knives and skewers. Dressed me up in women's clothes, messed around with gender roles, lined my eyes and called me pretty. I want to talk to you now about Laird. I saw one of the best pieces of music television. It was unplugged. It was you and the guitarist mm. just singing that song. And there was so much emotion. What goes through your mind when you're actually doing a song like that? When I'm doing songs that we've had for a while, a song like Laid, for me, the really important thing to make it fresh is to get vulnerable with it. Because you can just act it or you know you f you forget why you wrote it the, the initial impulse that sparked you and so the way to keep present and fresh and not become a stale dinosaur is you have to keep getting vulnerable it was so sexy though that i was in the gym and it was on the thing i was going <laughs> we figured everyone would think we were gay after that we thought this is like we turned it into almost a gay love song you it know, was it... so like it was just like it really moved me i was on the wow. step machine i had to stop lovely <laughs> <laughs>